so you were singing traditional music. You were you were singing in the church, and then you saw Sam Larner sing, and that sort of led you into folk music, or were you in folk music before that? Well, I was I was very interested in folk music. I decided that that was that was where I was go I was going to go, but it, but what what I had was what <laughs> quite a lot of people had was uh, had the repertoire which was around the world on the magic carpet of my guitar. Right, one of those. But when I saw Sam Lana, I was absolutely thunderstruck by what he could do. Right, all these songs that I thought I knew, but no, I, I, I they were they were different. They were different melodically. They were lyrically. They were totally different. They were much. I, I suppose you call them edgier, but it was it, it was just more interesting. Now, had he, because he was a fisherman during the day, I guess. So had he just naturally come into this style of playing? Like, where did it come from for him? You know. Well, it came it came from his from his community, I would imagine. He he was a retired he was retired as as a fisherman because it's a it's a, it's a tough job. But I think he retired in his late fifties, yeah, or maybe early sixties. But he'd been retired for oh, twenty years or something. But he 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 sang locally, and uh, he just had all, had this repertoire of songs, and there were a, a lot of people around at that time who still had a, a repertoire, which they they picked up, they picked up all their lives. Now, was it the finger picking and no, the... Nobody played an instrument. Nobody played an instrument. No. For me, the, the, the guitar started when, when I very first heard a song called The Rock Island Line, which was a huge hit for, for Lonnie Donegan in, in, in the UK and in the USA, in fact, worldwide. And I, I just w was fascinated by this by this music. The first st st stuff I had heard was Big Bill Brunsey singing singing the blues, and then I heard uh, Libba Cotton playing the guitar. This wonderful lyrical player, but just just beautiful, singing a song called Freight Train, which had been a very very big hit in England for one of the uh, English skiffle groups, uh, a man called Chas McDevitt. And I saw an article in one of the daily papers, which said that Chas McDevitt had tried to try, tried to own the song Freight Train, and had been sued right. by by representatives of, of, of Liber Cotton, right. and he had to pay pay every penny that he'd been paid back. He had to pay it all out to Liber Cotton. Right. Wonderful. And I was completely completely absorbed by that notion. When you think of traditional folk music, what do you think of? Well, I think I think it's 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 a music that changes all the time. And one of the things that that my generation of of singers and musicians did was to take another view on it. And and um, I can't say that it, that what Sam Lala did was inappropriate. I found it incredibly exciting. Right. That this was this was as far as I was concerned. This was this was the real deal. And and he he sang songs in a way that I, I, I didn't, simply didn't understand the, the, the music, that the tunes were, were, were different from anything I'd ever imagined. What, well, how were they different, Martin? What, what was it that you didn't understand about it? What was different? Well, I, I, I'd always assumed that because I'm English, I would understand English folk music. And I, it's not, that is not the way it is. Yeah. Because it's a music that is that that has been so, quite mercilessly sidelined for a long time, and of course, one thing that the that the Brits are good at doing is fighting wars. There was never a year in the, in the twentieth century when when Britain wasn't at war somewhere. Right. You know the obvious ones like, like World War One and World War Two, but then there were the, the, the colonial wars. Or the uh, the, uh, the anti-colonial wars, a lot of people agitating to 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 be out of the the British Empire, and our soldiers were sent to fight there, whether it be in 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 Malaya, whether it be basically all over the world. Cyprus, you know, the the, the, the Cyprus wanted to be to, to 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 be free of us. So there were these anti-colonial wars, if you like. And we didn't call them wars. It's 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 very much what governments do. They, they, if, if if you don't call it a war, then it isn't a war. But Putin's doing it right now. Right. 
did each one of those bring back songs? Did you get songs from each one of those places? Um, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. I, I, I know that, uh, that, that the music that was being offered to people as, as, as something that's interesting was, was, was trash. Rock and roll actually changed, changed a few things because it was ordinary people, ordinary people doing it. It wasn't the music business, it was people taking control of what was to be sung. And it went in all sorts of different and exciting directions with this thing called the guitar. There was a thing called the guitar craze. And people just picked up instruments and started to try and learn how to play them. And they were told they were they were told that what they were doing was rubbish. But we all felt terribly superior, <laughs> and <laughs> said, "You you just don't get it. You don't understand. We yeah. know what we're doing. <laughs> That's it." Now. <laughs> now, did you did you not grow up playing guitar? Did you get did you learn guitar at that time? So this is no, so I, this I, is this formative time is the nineteen fifties. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it, yes, indeed. And so you you played in open tunings and you play with a very uh, distinctive finger picking style. Were those were those you know? How did you arrive there? Oh, wow, it's a, it, it, it's it's a lifetime it's a lifetime thing. Um, when I was becoming very interested in traditional music, I, I met a, a group from uh, Harvard University called the Charles River Valley Boys. We, we used to sit in this little coffee bar called the Loft which was uh, just uh, 10 minutes down the road from where I lived. And we all sat together in, in, this, uh, in, in this coffee bar. We were the only people there and we just played music to each other. They, they played old timey music in this really interesting way. And it, it, was, it was just fascinating. Yeah, when we say old timey music, that describes a period of time that's not old time music. It describes a period of time, old timey music. Yeah? Exactly. Yeah, that, that's, that's right. But that, that's what they were playing. And I was listening to what I, I, I imagined to, to be the real thing. Well, they had learned it direct from people. One of the people in the Charles River Valley Boys um, mentioned this guy called Doc Watson, who said, and he said, and he's changed all the rules. He's, he's just extraordinarily good as, as, mm -hmm. as a musician. I didn't get to hear him until much later because the, the albums just weren't available. But you, you hear these names and I'm starting to play this old timey music and I was hearing all sorts of uh, all sorts of echoes of something else when I was thinking about the English tunes that I was beginning to learn. Because I, I'd, one of the things I'd done was to go to Cecil Sharp House and I bought all the copies because uh, you, you could buy the whole set of, 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 of books of the journals, the, the Journal of the Folk Song Society. Mm -hmm. And that, that stuff going from what, 1899 to, through to about 1932, when it became the English Folk Dance and Song Society. Mm -hmm. And this Folk Song Society stuff was just fascinating. And I was having these very, very, very odd tunes, the like of which I'd never heard before and, and I'd never imagined. And I was hearing echoes of it. some of the mountain mountain music that uh, Charles of the Valley Boys were playing. There were echoes yeah. in, in that. And of, of, of stuff I, was, I was looking at and, and, look, and being interested in. I couldn't play the guitar very well, but I wanted to play guitar. Yeah. You know, a lot of times when people talk about music, they try and separate the lyrics from the music as if you could do that, as if it's not just right. one thing. But, but were you seeing things in the lyrics that were meaningful? Well, I, I realised how much this, much it had changed, and it was a big a beginning of an understanding that that the nature of tradition is change. Um, always, the, the things will change, they, 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 and they must change. But I just I was hearing all sorts of echoes and thinking, what what what's, what's going on here? I, I just wanted to know more all the time. I, I mean, I love the guitar. I, I was learning tunes which I would never sing until I could play them. Mm. I mean, I, I met singers in, in 1961 when I first went up to, to, to Scotland. I met this uh, singer called Geordie Hamilton. He was, he, he was a coal miner and he had a repertoire of, of songs that he had just picked up. It's the, you know, the traditional process 
and he chose he chose me for a particular song, a song called Bonnie Woodhall. He said, "You you got to learn this song. You got to sing this song." And he taught me this song, and I never sang it. I always had it in I always had it in my head. Always had it in my repertoire, and until I could play the tune, I never actually sang the song out. So I, I, I finally sang it out, having heard it, having heard him sing it in 1961. I think I waited more than 25 years before I tried to do it myself because I wanted to play. I wanted to be be able to play it in a convincing manner. Now that's part of the tradition, isn't it, Martin? I think so. That tradition is sort of lost now, where you pick up uh, odds and ends of different songs and bring them together and synthesize them. That is the folk tradition: is that you can take a little bit from here and a little bit from there. We don't think of it so much that way anymore but is is that part of the tradition well i i, I think it, it it's unavoidable i was beginning to, to to listen to 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 what i used to call old singers <laughs> i'm an old singer now yeah but i was beginning to listen to those to, to, to those uh, old, old old men and old women singing songs uh, and some of the recordings that i was getting to hear had been made before the First World War, they were on cylinder. Mm -hmm. And I was hearing this beautiful music and this wonderful singing. And I just wanted to be a part of it. I just, it was important to me. I just, I, I didn't expect, I didn't care if any, if people didn't like it. You just stood up and sang in the folk club and, and people were delighted to hear it. That, that, that you've got tremendous encouragement from, from the folk singing because we were just, the, the, the clubs at that time were run by people who were my age. Uh, the audiences that came were my age. Yeah, you know, we, we, were, we, were, we were in a whole movement that that was always arguing among themselves because that that's what and it was a very it was a very it was a very lefty movement. And you know what the left are like? They, yeah, they, they just fight each other the whole time. It's too busy <laughs> fighting each other to make music sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but that. That's that's what makes it exciting. What is your definition of folk music? What is it that distinguishes it? You know, we, we have all these different genres, but what if you were to say the identifying feature of a folk music? Well, I've, I've stopped trying to do that because one of the things I've had to recognize is, for instance, that rock and roll is folk music. Jazz is folk music. That's what it is. It becomes impossible to, to do a serious thing about it. You choose, I choose a, a particular part of it to champion because I think it's, it's, it's fascinating, it's beautiful, it makes, it, it, lyrically, it, it, it has a life, has, has a liveliness in, in it that, that demands that you, you, you take a hold of it and you take control of it and you can't control it can you martin when you first would listen to those records you know were they like time travel you know a lot of times when we listen to those you know there's a lot of things now about trying to make recording perfect but when you listen to songs you know it's it's also it's not just the singer and the it's the room it's the uh outside the room there were things happening and all of that gets brought into the recording especially when you're listening to those cylinder records they almost feel like time travel how, how do they feel to you when you listen to them well, I, there, there was a purity on it, uh, about it that i found totally irresistible the, the purity was was ever so slightly false because the, the the recordings were actually pretty damaged right so what you were hearing in this pure tone that was coming out how is this person singing like that well he wasn't singing like that something has happened to the, the, the quality of the recording right. so what you're being given is a melody and some words that was the exciting thing about it you, you it was it was the whole thing was very mysterious and, and a lot of people try including me tried to imitate it and, it, and there was a falseness about it but you're on a journey and, and, you're, and, and the, the whole thing is, has been a journey for me and it's still going on. You know, I'm, I'm still, still realizing things and, 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 and finding something that I heard 50 years ago is colossally exciting because somebody has cleaned up the recording and it's a, it's a bit more rough and tumble, but it's still wonderful music. Now, so you know you're going to be a part of it. You know you want to learn guitar. How long before 
it starts to become clubs and places and a community for you. Like oh, in, in the beginning, in the beginning, are you by yourself? And then slowly, you know, you, it starts to form these these clubs that become so popular in England. And, you know, the that, that's yeah, that, that, that's the sort of thing that happened as far as I was concerned. When, when, when I was first interested, there were places in London. I was I was com you know, completely London centric. I think I, I went up to Scotland qu quite quickly and I was absolutely thunderstruck by what uh, I used to work, I worked in theatre for a while and I, I was working back, back to sort of on, on touring shows and I remember being in uh, in Glasgow uh, at one point and, I, and the, the man who was the, the, the master carpenter at the theatre, I was, I, was, um, I, I was a backstage person, he was kept talking about the Glasgow Folk Song Club and I, I wanted to know about this and he said, well, we're, we're here for two weeks. You've got a day off on Sunday. I'll take you. Meet, meet. You can meet some of the people. I, I went with with him, and I met these two, I mean, two, three, four people, who became central to my uh, my understanding of what what the hell was going on in Glasgow, in, in, in Scotland. There was a similar thing happening in Scotland, and I met a man called uh, Archie Fisher. His sister who was called Ray Fisher. And Ray Fisher was one of the giants of, of the Scottish revival scene. He's just an astonishing singer. She's been she died within the last ten years. Yeah, but she was an astonishing singer, and she in, in, intuitively understood that the, the women singers she loved to hear, like Jeannie Robertson, weren't that far away from Bessie Smith. Mm. You know, that's what that that was something that. All that always haunted me about that, about Ray when she sang was that she loved Jeannie Robertson. She also loved Bessie Smith, mm -hmm. and what she loved was the same thing. I began to understand a bit later on that, that, that trying to insist on a separate cubicle for folk music was a nonsense. People will play what they want to play, and deal with it is the answer. They, they dealt with me for years when I was singing, <laughs> I was singing yeah. abominably. Help me, help me along. Cheer me, cheer, cheer me to the echo. But you know, you're, you're learning all the time, more and more and more. It never stops. Still, yeah. it still hasn't, hasn't stopped. Now, you described those those people earlier. You said they're sort of left leaning, but isn't it more than just left leaning? Like, what kind of people are attracted to playing and being a part of this music? You know, it's like it attracts you living in England. It attracts my dad living where he lives. You know, in Minnesota. You know, it's like it, it attracts all these these different kinds of people were all chosen to play this music or to be a part of this scene. Was there something that was common to them? But it was, but it was different. It, it was ignored. People, people are fascinated by some get, get, get fascinated by something that everybody else is ignoring. Hmm. And you, you find yourself being sucked into it. And, and certainly what, what happened with me and I heard I heard Big Bill Brunzi, as I say. I heard I heard Liver Cotton, and then I heard Sister uh, uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp. And, I mean, a lot a lot of the people were blues were blues performers because the, the jazz bands in, in Britain were bringing people over. They brought over Chris Barber, the trombone player, in, uh, had his own. What we, we call them trad bands. Um, or, or New Orleans bands, or because we began to divide it up but even then. Um, but there's a fellow called Ken Collier, and Ken Collier would bring over to, to, to Britain people like uh, Sanitary and Brownie McGee. They'd bring, bring over Big Bull Broomsy. Did you see some of those shows, Martin? No. No. I, I, I bought the records. I bought the records. So when does it become clubs around London? Like, tell me, like, when it really got going in London, what was a day like? What was, would you go from club to club to club? Like, what would it be like when the folk clubs really came in in uh, 1961? Well, folk clubs started to open around 60, 61. I remember being, I used to do gigs in, in, the, in, in the coffee bars and you would sing all night and you would get paid a pound and, uh, and, and a big plate of spaghetti, you know, that, that, was, that, that, was the, that was the deal. And, and you sang, I don't know, you sang basically all night, it started at eight o'clock and finished at half past 11. And it was very exciting. People would show up who could play better than you. So, and there were quite a few of them. <laughs> but, you know, they, 
just learn, everybody learned from everybody else and would mention names. There were some who were, who considered themselves to be somehow purer than everybody else. And, oh, yeah, that's, that's all right. They could play, certainly. And so wanted to learn from them, watch what they did say, how do you do that? Now, there was a fellow called John Pierce, who ended up living in the States. He died about 10 or 15 years ago. He used to make guitar strings. He, he, he was a person who, who regarded himself as, as a teacher. If you, if you played something in front of you and you said, how do you play that? He would stop and he would show you exactly what he was doing. There were the other people who could play stuff and they, it was a secret. So they, they, no, not telling, not, I, I promised I wouldn't show anybody. You know, it's, it's, right. so you were dealing with, with, with the two, so you had to train your ears to, to steal. <laughs> now, did audiences start to come in? When do you remember audiences really starting to come in and respond? Well, this was a sort. Of, it was generally understood that this was that we were an, we were an underground. You know, there were there were other people who told us that, you know, quite clearly that we that we were rubbish, and we our reply was always, "You just don't get it." You know, but we're, we're really brilliant. <laughs> right, right. But we were we were interested. We were. We wanted to know where this music was, is, where it comes from, what, what, what can it do? Some people took it alarmingly seriously. Others just were nosy. You know, I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm nosy. I'm still nosy. I want, I want to know why and where. That's what I want. And I, I, I want to be able to explore. I love them. And, and people really like the idea of people who want to explore. Right. And things are getting mixed up, and in a very interesting way. Each each has its own. I call it purity. I wish it wouldn't that, 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 right that word. But it has its own character, has its right. own genuine character, and that's what happened to folk. I mean, we all split into little movements. You know, we're, you know, we're, we're more interesting than you. Clubs started opening in, 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 in end, end, end of the fifties, beginning of the sixties. Yeah, there was one club called the Ballads and Blues, which was uh, run run by Ewan McCall, and he had a good stand up argument with his the, the person who organised his his club, who wanted to become an agent, and, and Ewan was furious with him, so broke off all the relations, shut down the club, and left left the bloke to be a named Malcolm Mixon, left Malcolm Mixon to to to, to be an agent, and even right. wrote a root song about him called Mister Ten Percent. But it was part of, part of, became part of growing up. A couple of years later, Ewan opened a club which he called the Singers Club. And that was, it was incredibly serious. But the, the, the nice thing about it was they wanted to sing songs that were either English or Scots. It focused the mind. When you were um, not playing, were you going to other clubs to see what was going on? I would always go, go go to other clubs with a guitar. People tend to, tend to go, go to clubs, you know, with, and uh, these days with maybe with a, a recording machine and recording what people do. But back then, we were all in, in this together. There were people who who, who were thought of as being exciting. I, I became one of those people who, who thought like that. And I, I was interested in, in playing with other people who did a version of what I loved. But um, I needed to, to, to learn how to spread my wings and just play something that qualified as, 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 as folk music. Even if I wasn't crazy about it, I would just le learn how to do it so I could join in a session. Now, you know, now my dad came there um, to do a play in 1962. That's right. Now, where did you run into him? Did you just run into him? Well, the thing was, the man who brought lots of people over was Albert Grossman. And uh, whenever Albert Gosman came to England, he would come with with one of his charges. On this particular occasion, he came he came with your dad. And the club I was I, I was uh, helping to run with, with, with a, a band called the Thamesiders, which had been the Thameside Four, and one of us one of us left, <laughs> and uh, we became the Thamesiders. And, uh, and we were 
we did, 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 did a, a very wide repertoire. Some of it was extremely good. Some of it was, yeah. The Thamesiders ran this club at the King and Queen, which was right next door to what was then a big hospital. It was the Middlesex Hospital on, on Foley Street, F-O-L-E-Y. Yeah. Um, your dad came with Albert. And uh, I'm, I'm standing in the audience and I suddenly looked down and I saw this face. And I thought, I know you. I know you. I saw, I, I saw your face on, that, on, on, on the cover of Sing Out. But, but it, it was in Collett's record shop. And I said, and I was just, just drawn towards it. He said, who's, who's that? Who's this bloke? Because it was clear that they were very, that Sing Out were very excited about, about his dad. Right. And he was, he was just sitting there and I finished a song and I, I walked over to him and I said, oh, you're Bob Dylan, aren't you? And he just looked at me, <laughs> startled. Yeah. I said, I saw you, I've got the copy of Sing Out with your face on the front. Would you like to sing a couple of songs? And he said, he just looked at me and he said, ask me later. <laughs> so I, so I said, so we finished the first half and he, he, he went out and he obviously talked to his dad. Sorry, talked to his manager, talked to Albert. Yeah. And Albert said, do you want to do it? He said, and he must have said, yeah. And understood that to, what happens to somebody who's invited to sing is they get three songs. Right. That was the understanding. I think your dad knew that. And he stood up and I saw him sitting in the audience and uh, again, and he had, had, this, had his guitar with him out of its case. So I looked at him, I did that look on, you know, he did something, do you want to do it now? And he just said, okay. And he, and he stood up and he sang, he sang three songs. And it's, uh, it, was, it was fantastic. He, it was actually, people were blown away by what he could do. And he sang, sang a very sort of ragtimey thing. To start with, I don't remember what it was called, and he did a talking blues, and I think it might have been the one he the one he did about the John Birch Society, right? And people got it, and I think he was fairly startled by the fact that we were that well informed about the John Birch Society, right? Um, and the, the, the last song he sang it might it might have been "Blowing in the Wind," right? Because he, I did, I did, did hear him sing, sing, sing it once. The thing I remember about, about your dad is wherever he came, he would sing two or three songs and they would always be different. He never repeated himself. Right. He, he really got, got to see a, 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 bit of his, a bit of his repertoire. I mean, I remember what, the, the night he stood up and he sang, it starts off like, um, like Lord Ram, where, where have you been, young Jimmy, my son? What is that one? What is um, it for? Uh, I know the song it's you're talking about. Hard rains are going to fall. Hard rains are going to yeah, fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it Lord Randall. Off, it yeah, exactly. Off sounding like Lord, Lord Randall. And, <laughs> yeah. But again, then it became something entirely different. Yeah. And, it, and the audience were completely spellbound by yeah. this song. But isn't that what you were just saying earlier, though, about folk, that it's someone's deep personal interpretation and you'd reference Doc Watson earlier who was riffing on something. So is that essentially what Bob Dylan was doing as well? He was taking these things that might have been traditional and then putting his own personal feeling about this. Oh, oh absolutely. Oh, I mean, he sang, he sang a few traditional songs. He, uh, <laughs> I always remember when somebody questioned him about, about, his, uh, uh, about his first album. And said, uh, "How did you pick the songs on that?" And he said, "Well, I don't know. I just sang. I sang all these songs that that, that, that I knew." And the engineer said, "When are you going to sing some folk songs?" And he said, "Well, what do you mean by a folk song?" And he said, "Well, sing Pretty Peggy." He said, "Okay, I'll sing Pretty Peggy." And he started to sing it and started to make up verses. And he had this wonderful, wonderful verse about he is gone. He's he's long gone. He's riding down in Texas with the rodeo. And then uh, and on, uh, and in front of the troubadour audience, he, he sang another verse. And he sang about Captain, he's gone, he's long gone. He's, he's fighting with the wild man out in Borneo. And it was, uh, 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 brought, I don't know if he brought the house down. That was when somebody had actually asked him to sing a, tr a traditional song in the troubadour. And he sang that. And it was, it was hilarious. And it just, it brought the house down. Right? <laughs> He, he was just uh, just be, being a tease, and it was uh, it was great to, great to hear and see. Um, he was having fun. Now he's he stayed with you for a while, then, yeah. 
No, well, no, he would come. He would come back. He, he was staying in one of the one of the one of the big hotels. Yeah. So he would come back to. I was married to this this guy called Dorothy at the time, and he would come back to Dorothy's and my place, and we would just sit around and uh, and sing. Yeah. And play to each other and just talk, just talk. And that's a part of the tradition too, to just swap songs all oh. the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a part of it. And he was uh, he sang a few. Of his, I remember one particular night he sang a few of his songs. And there were two songs that stuck in my mind. One of them I wrote down, and that was the one about it's the the the, the black kid who went that was from, was he from New York or Chicago or something? And he went down into Mississippi, and um, he, he whistled at a at a, 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 a very you know, nice nice looking white girl and. And one of the and one of the other ones was was that wonderful one um, about uh, Hollis Brown. Yeah, yeah. which I, I was I was absolutely blown away by. It was just it was wonderful. Um, you went to see my dad recently, right? You saw him play recently, yeah. Hmm. How was that? Oh, it was great. We hadn't we hadn't actually seen each other properly for more more than 40 years mm. I'd, I'd seen him briefly at um black bush airport when mm -hmm. he they stuck did, did a very successful tour with a big band yeah and he, he he'd invited me along and it took me <laughs> three hours to get backstage to see him yeah um which it was it was lovely he, he, he said he basically said hello we didn't, he didn't talk much yeah i i enjoyed seeing him it was it was a, a total delight but when we actually saw each other in in, in the hotel, I was, uh, I was I was chatting with, with Ike, and he's 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 lovely. What a lovely lad! Mm. Not many guitar he had. Was a gorgeous. Oh, I'd never seen an, an OM yeah an, uh, OM eighteen before. And this is just exquisite, and he played it, and he's got a really really beautiful touch. Yeah. He's a he's a smashing lad. He yeah. really is. Really, really enjoyed meeting him. Yeah. Now, did a lot of other performers start to come around then in the in the nineteen sixty two? You know, like um, Paul Simon came. Like, did other did well, other? He came in about sixty, sixty three, sixty four. Yeah. Yeah. It was it, when your dad arrived. It was the very end of sixty one. Mm -hmm. So d doing this play called Madhouse on Castle Street. Which I saw and I, I finally got. I did. I, I, I understood it. And that they had to bring a, a great actor in to do to, to do your dad's part. And yeah. They gave the script to the script to do, and he said, "What? <laughs> What's all this? Are you learning?" He said, "I can't do this. <laughs> I can't do this. I'll, I'll sing songs. Get someone else." And they got this guy who was the he just done. Uh, at the Royal Shakespeare Company, he'd done a, a version of Hamlet that absolutely blew people away. And it's David something. He's, he's oh, he's, he's, he's a great, he's a great actor. You'd know straight away. He was in that wonderful thing. What was that? What was that um, thing called? The, 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 the one that was all it was. Kids get sucked into it, sucked into a, into into a game. And they've got to get out. Oh, um, Jumanji. Not Jumanji. No, 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 no. It's oh. way before Jumanji. It's the, it's before the one. Jumanji. No, no, so you're not talking about. No, it's not Jumanji. It's it's the one. Sorry, hang on a sec. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's talking, the, it's, it's are you the, talking about the one with? Um, with, 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 with oh, I know the one. The, the blue Jeff one. Jeff Bridges. Jeff yeah. Bridges. It's called. Oh damn it! No, hang on. Uh, Tron was it Tron? People getting sucked into into into, into a, a sorry. A what game. did Jesse say? Was it Tron? Tron. Tron. Yeah, that's yeah. it. That's yeah, thank you. Oh, oh that, was, that was that was such a such a good film. Yeah. And yeah. this guy, David Warner. David Warner. Thank yeah. you, David yeah. Warner. And how was how was my dad in the play? Was he was he would he just come out and play some songs and then the David Warner? Oh yeah, yeah. Was it sort of a blend? Like, did it all hang together, or was it sort of a strange? You know, what did you think after you saw it? Well, it it, it, it was what it was. It was it was just a, a mixture of people. It was written by this guy who was uh, he, he was Jamaican, and he'd just come to London, and he and he found he found, I found London completely inexplicable and crazy. 
Right. And the, uh, that's why he called the play Madhouse on Castle Street. It, it was uh, that the house was full of these wildly different people right. who sort of, sort of got on and sort of didn't. You yeah. know, it was just the, 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 a, a brilliant mixture of people. And the BBC were foolish enough to, to, to wipe the tape. Oh, dear me. <laughs> yeah. Martin, thank you so much for spending so much time with me talking about these things. I appreciate all these insights, you know? Well, it's, it's very nice of you. I mean, I, I've, I've had a great time. I've had a great time now for 60 years. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 and it's never ending. Just yeah. Keep on, keep, keep on lighting on something that's, I mean, in many ways, um, locked, lockdown has been, has been a gift because I've sort of been sitting here and remembering songs that, 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 that I knew 60 years ago. Yeah. And so, Sometimes regretting it. Yeah, <laughs> the songs were bloody awful, but yeah. some of them, some of them were sensational. Yeah, you know, they, they songs that I still still sing, and I've resurrected a couple of them because yeah. they're such, such good songs. Yeah. Well, you're yeah. lucky you have that memory that you can you can remember them all. You know. Well, I can remember some of them, and others I, I was just yeah. You know, if, deserted if it was the sixties, you weren't ready there, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you guys very much this has been wonderful and you know i look forward to speaking again oh i'd love it enjoy i've enjoyed this so much thank you so much thank you anytime